All right, good afternoon and welcome to our weekly Friday Assembly. Today we are delighted to have Dr. Angela Lee as our guest. She's here to answer your questions about the coronavirus and COVID-19. Before we start, though, as we do every Friday, I'm going to ask Alyssa Sugiyama to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Assembly stand. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for it to stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alyssa. Dr. Angelili is here, as I said earlier. Uh, Dr. Angelili is a graduate of Buckley, class of 1992. After Buckley, you went on to Exeter, is that correct? Yes. And then Cornell, yes. right? And then uh, you went to medical school at NYU. And then after that, your residency, tell me more about Also at NYU, and then I did a fellowship in glaucoma uh, at New York Eye Near. Great, great, terrific. So Dr. Angelili has been here at Buckley already. Uh, uh, running workshops for our faculty. She also serves on our Board of Trustees and has been a great help to me uh, during this uh, pandemic. Um, I have to ask before we start, what team are you on? Blue. Oh, blue. Great. Blue. Okay, she gets to stay. All right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about your own experience professionally and personally with uh, coronavirus. Absolutely. So, um, uh, just like the rest of us, um, the the medical community was was largely caught a, a little bit off guard by it, um, because of the type of patients that I, I treat. They really do require constant care, and so I did practice um, throughout the pandemic. And um, while I don't deal specifically directly with uh, patients with coronavirus, uh, obviously my office had to change drastically the way that it functions in order to safely continue to deliver care. And I'm really proud that uh, we were able to see um, a good volume of patients that required care to even operate on some uh, more emergent patients um, and learn a lot about how to keep a medical practice running safely in this new environment. Um, I think at home, I struggled with the same exact challenges that the rest of, of the parents did, trying to keep my career going while making sure, sure. Um, that, that my children were okay during um, a relatively tumultuous time. Um, and uh, I'm really proud that in my own practice, we had no coronavirus transmissions as of yet and that um, we've been able to uh, pick back up our volume and really start treating patients great. again in spite of um, the new directives. Great, that's great. Now, Dr. Angela Lee, we have uh, students who would like to ask you questions. Okay. Are you ready for that? Yes. Okay. Dr. Angela Lee, our first question is from first grade. Uh, it is from somebody you might recognize. Okay. Hi, my name is Willie. And I have a question that when are we not going to wear masks at school? Well, Willie, thank you so much. That's, that's a great question and I think it's a really great place to start. And I think it's important first that we understand why we wear masks. Um, so uh, when we uh, talk, when we laugh, when we cough, sneeze, um, or just breathe, um, we emit tiny little droplets of liquid from our mouths and our noses. And those little droplets tend to go into the air around us. And the problem is that those droplets can carry germs in them. And um, those germs can be breathed in by other people around us and in some cases can lead to illness. So the purpose of a mask in this instance is that it helps prevent those droplets from actually entering the air. Um, a lot of people uh, believe that we're wearing masks actually to protect ourselves. And um, in some cases in hospitals, that's actually true. But in school and um, in public, the reason that we wear a mask is to protect the people around us, which is why it really only works if everybody does it. Mm. Um, and you're not just protecting the people around you, but you're protecting all of their friends and family, the people in their household. So uh, when you wear a mask, you're actually um, helping to uh, maintain the safety and health of, of your friends and their friends and family. Um, so 
Um, it's your question is a little bit complicated, and I don't 100% know the answer um, as to when we'll be able to stop wearing masks. Of course, um, coronavirus, the germ that we're currently concerned about, is not the only germ that can spread around a school. Um, especially in the winter time, we can have the flu um, travel in those little droplets, or um, common colds, or a stomach bug, which nobody wants to get. Um, but in general, those things are so low risk that we typically feel comfortable without masks on. We just wash hands and we try not to touch our faces. The same thing will be true of coronavirus-related mask wearing. At some point, we will feel that coronavirus is low risk enough that we can take our masks off safely. And there's probably one of three ways that that will happen. One is that we develop a cure for coronavirus. Two is that we develop a vaccine to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. And the third possibility, which has happened in pandemics in the past, is that um, enough people around us have been exposed mm -hmm. such that when coronavirus is in the air, people don't really get sick from it. The other thing that can happen at the same time is something that um, uh, doctors and nurses call attenuation which means that a virus can become less dangerous over time so that it's still around, but it's not that much of a threat. So in my opinion, if I had to guess, I think masks are going to be with us for uh, the foreseeable future, but not forever. Um, and that's the thing to focus on. Great. So you're saying we need to wear masks. Yes. At some point we won't have to anymore, Definitely. but we just don't know when yet. That's right. One of the things I really like that you told the faculty is that you said that wearing masks is a great opportunity to teach lessons in empathy to our children. Yes. Correct? Yeah, yeah I, I really agree. When you wear your mask, you're very powerful. You're basically saying to the people around you, I care about you. I may not know you. You may be different from me. I might have nothing in common with you, but I care about you. I care about your family members. And I think it's... Um, that's part of the Buckley way. This is why I think, um, you know, the kids in this school are, are really rising to the occasion. Yeah, and they're doing a great job wearing their masks, yeah. I have to say. <sighs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Angela Lilly. Our next question comes from third grade. Somebody else you may know as well. Hi, my name is Peter, and my question is, is it ever safe to be less than six feet apart? Okay, thank you so much, Peter. It's, a, it's another really uh, thoughtful question. So um, where did we come up with this idea that people should be six feet yeah. apart? Well, it, it relates back to um, that, uh, those droplets that I was just talking about that we naturally um, uh, tend to emit when we um, just breathe, talk. Um, and what scientists have discovered is that those droplets tend not to travel more than six feet away in most cases. And so um, we look to a number of uh, health organizations to help guide us as to our behavior, both in public and private life. And one of them is, is called the Center for Disease Control, or the CDC. And they look at data from scientists who have studied coronavirus and other germs and try to uh, come up with uh, guidelines that will realistically help us prevent the further spread of disease. So one of them is what we now know as social distancing, which basically means keeping a distance of six feet or more from people when possible. The fact is we've all realized it's not entirely possible to do that all the time. So in my practice, uh, in order to take care of people properly, um, I obviously have to be very close to patients to take care of them. I have to touch them, I have to come near them, I have to do surgery on them. It's not possible to socially distance sure. all the time. Um, here, uh, if your teacher needs to show you something, they may you know, want to come closer to you to help show you um, how to solve a problem. Um, if you love basketball, um, that's a sport that you just physically can't distance while yeah. you play. So there's a lot of instances where you probably realistically can't socially distance. Um, and that's why the other measures that are in place exist. Because um, 
uh, by having barriers between us that can help allow us to come closer together, mm -hmm. but be protected. Um, the other um, uh, measure is being outside really helps because if the droplets that you breathe out go into the air, the wind will carry them away more quickly than it would inside. Um, and then of course the mask wearing when you have to come right. close to somebody is incredibly important, particularly important. Um, the the way that I look at all of these measures is sort of like taking an umbrella outside with you in the rain. It's not going to 100% prevent mm -hmm. you from getting wet, but it does a really good job actually. Um, so we can look at them all together as just building a larger umbrella to help protect ourselves and the people around us. Of course, it's not possible to socially distance from uh, the members of your own household and you actually don't, as you know, right. have to wear right. masks. Um, as long as everybody in your household is feeling well. Right, right. So that's why at lunch we have those barriers because students right. cannot wear masks right. during lunch yep. and so on and so forth. I understand duration is important also, right? So we had the lockdown drill this morning. Obviously sure. the children had to be closer than six feet apart, right. but for a short period of time, right? Yeah, yeah there's, there's, um, there's a lot of evidence that you need sustained contact right. in order to breathe in someone else's germs. And we believe it's about 10 to 15 okay. minutes. So um, you don't have to be afraid if you go for a run and someone runs sure. by you really yeah. quickly. That's not considered sustained contact. Um, I think it also bears mentioning that there was some fear for a while that coronavirus can live on surfaces, yes. and um, it may. It's not the primary way that people um, get coronavirus. The primary way is by breathing it in. Um, but because we can do things like clean um, and wash our hands and not touch our face with our hands, because that's how coronavirus Thank might goodness. enter our system, um, we, we do those things as an extra layer of safety. Great. So we're going to skip a few grades now and go right to one of our seniors, a lifer here at Buckley. So here's a question from our eighth grade. My name is Daniel and my question is, this is novel coronavirus and there are many different types of coronavirus. What makes this one so different? Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, so the reason we call uh, this novel coronavirus is because it is in fact new to us. Mm -hmm. um, it was identified in 2019, which is why it's called coronavirus 19. And um, we do know a lot about other coronaviruses. There are um, six of them. Uh, the reason, interestingly, that they're called coronaviruses is because if you look at the tiny virus particle under a very, very high definition microscope, it actually has little spikes on its mm -hmm. outer capsule. And it looks like the spikes on a crown. And mm -hmm. corona is, of course, a crown in Latin. So. Um, the four out of the six of the coronaviruses that we already knew about simply cause the common cold. cold. Mm -hmm. um, one of them did also cause a widespread um, severe infection, which is what we call a, a pandemic, and okay. you've all heard that word now. Um, and that was fortunately um, eradicated fairly quickly in the early 2000s. Um, the difference between a uh, novel coronavirus and other coronaviruses that cause the common cold is um, that in some people, in a minority of people, it can cause some problems with internal organs as the body tries to fight it off. Um, most people, especially children, really have very mild cases of coronavirus and some people, probably a lot of people, um, don't even know Daniel, that they yes. have it. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in a very small minority of people, it can cause issues. Um, and, and sometimes major ones. And, and that's why we talk a lot about, about protecting elderly and protecting right. people that have multiple medical problems or whose immune systems don't fight off infection as well as, as ours might. And um, um, however, fortunately, most people are, are minimally infected, uh, minimally affected by it. Great, thank you again. Um, our next question comes from the fourth grade and I think it has to do with how this all started. Hi. My name is Nosa, and here's my question. The question is, how did coronavirus start? 
Was there any person, animal, item, or food that started it? Thanks so much, Nosa. It's a great question, and I think it's a really important one um, as we try to learn from this and try to figure out how to prevent future issues like this. Um, what we do know is that this virus emerged uh, first in Wuhan, China, in late 2019. And, um, as is the case in, in multiple previous pandemics, probably what happened is the virus started in an animal mm -hmm. that is close enough to humans that it was able to jump over from one species to the human oh, species. Um, and we don't quite know what species that was. There's a lot of um, controversy about that because we've not been able to identify an animal with coronavirus yet. Um, but yeah. there are some thoughts that it could be bats um, or it could be pangolin, which are um, uh, an almost extinct uh, relative of anteaters. And um, we don't know, because we don't know the original host, we don't know how that contact initially occurred, even though we know where and when it occurred. Um, and uh, we really don't know if it's because someone ate an infected mm. animal or if someone just came very close to an infected animal. Right. Right. But it's, it's critical that we find that out because we want to make sure that um, these sorts of, of instances are, are minimized in the and future. Controlled. Yeah, great. All right, we have a question now from a seventh grader. Hi, I'm Anna, and my question for you is, what is the treatment for COVID-19? Does it just go away, and can you get it more than once? Thank you so much, Anna. That's a, that's a great question. So um, all of us have been sick before at one right. point. Um, if you've ever had strep throat, you know that you get a bad sore throat, you feel really sick, your parent takes you to the doctor, and you get prescribed an antibiotic that makes you feel better within a couple of days. And that's because strep throat is a bacteria, which is a different type of germ okay. than a virus. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard actually to cure viruses because of the way that they um, multiply inside of us. So um, we don't have a, a, a cure for coronavirus. Um, one of two things happens when you're infected with a virus. One of them is that you can uh, become chronically or permanently infected and um, doctors and nurses will work to control the symptoms of that virus long term. And the other is that your body mounts an immune response, a, a, literally an attack on that virus, and eliminates it from, from your body. Um, the issue, as I mentioned before, in coronavirus is that in some people, that response can be so strong that it causes other issues inside the body. And that's what nurses and doctors work on when they have a patient who's severely um, affected by coronavirus. So sometimes it could be something as simple as giving someone extra oxygen to breathe. Okay. Um, one fascinating thing that we've learned is that turning people on their bellies or prone is better than many of the other things that we do for people that are having trouble breathing. And that's wow. been a wonderful part about this, is that um, even though coronavirus is very widespread, it ha actually, we've gotten much, much, much better at knowing how to treat it. Things like anti-inflammatories, things like making sure your blood and your heart are still functioning properly. So what we call supportive measures until the person can sort of rebound on their own. And now from home, from her home, Sianna in second grade. I heard there was gonna be a vaccine for COVID-19. I was wondering, will it be available for adults and children? Thank you so much, Sianna. Um, well, you know, one of the most exciting things about this has been the ingenuity um, that uh, scientists have shown right. and the rapidity um, with which people have responded um, in trying to uh, develop a successful uh, vaccine for coronavirus. So firstly, what is a vaccine? Um, a vaccine, you've all gotten them, is an injection that you get either once or multiple times. And it's, um, it contains in it a substance that's close enough to coronavirus to make your body think it, that you've yeah. had it. It tricks your body into thinking you've had it without making you sick. 
Um, and that way, when you actually are around coronavirus, you won't get sick. Um, in the case of the flu vaccine, which we have to get every year, um, if, if it doesn't prevent you from getting the flu, if you happen to get the flu, it makes the flu much more mild. Um, so, uh, you know, the question of when we're going to um, have it, we'll, we'll get yeah. to. But um, yes, the idea is that um, ultimately adults and children would be vaccinated. Okay. And the reason for that is that even though kids don't tend to get severely affected by coronavirus, mm -hmm. we do know that they carry it and they can spread it. I see. So just like the flu, um, while it's most important for um, vulnerable people like the elderly to have it, it really works best if we all have the flu shot because then we're likely to, to protect the people around us. Right. So it protect others like yes. the mask also. Yes. Great, great. Thank you. Yes. And now from the sixth grade, Max has a question for you. Hi, my name is Max and here's my question. When will we finally get a vaccine for coronavirus and how will we know that it's safe? Thanks so much, Max. It's a great question and you're definitely not the only person wondering that. That's for sure. Um, so the, the, when a vaccine gets studied, it really has to be very rigorously studied. So we have to balance our collective desire for having a vaccine available really quickly mm -hmm. with um, the necessity of making sure that it's safe for everybody and that it actually works. So the way that, that scientists do that is, is by um, having a series of clinical trials. Um, first, scientists work in a laboratory to develop a vaccine. They look at the virus and they look at what sort of targets they can match um, to trigger that um, immune reaction that we want. And, um, and that's all done in a laboratory. The second phase is usually done on animals. So animals that are similar enough to yeah. humans that we can um, try to um, make sure that it's relatively safe. Okay. And then the third phase is um, in volunteers. Right now, they're just adults. Um, that's the way that clinical trials tend to work. But volunteers come and, and get uh, vaccines, and um, and then scientists watch and see how good they are at creating that response that they're looking for. Does that response last long enough to make it worthwhile to get a vaccine? And is it safe? Making sure that there's no side effects from the vaccine that could make, make it problematic to give it mm. on a wide scale. Um, it's really quite remarkable that in eight months, Many, many countries are in right. phase three of clinical trials. And in the United States, there are four phase three clinical trials ongoing right now. Um, and um, there's a lot of conversation about when they may be available. Um, it's probably not going to be until 2021. Okay. And then you have to think also about how to mass produce that vaccine, mm -hmm. ma yeah, mass produce, mass and mass distribute, because it can't just be for the people who have money. That's right. It has to be for everybody, mm -hmm. um, both to be fair and for it to work. Right. And not just for people who might get sick. We also Exactly. Have to, mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. really, um, you know, the same way that we uh, vaccinate for measles and now measles almost doesn't exist. Um, that only works because everybody gets their measles vaccines when they're little. Great. Thank you. And our last question comes from the fifth grade. Hi, my name is Orlando, and this is my question. There have been other pandemics before this one, but yet we were not well prepared. What can our country do to be better prepared if it happens again? Thank you so much, Orlando. Um, you know, this is probably the most difficult question yeah, that, that we've gotten, and it's a great one and a really thoughtful one, and I appreciate it. Um, I think that... Um, I personally, when I have a personal challenge, um, try to look at a situation and ask myself, um, what did I do well and what could I have done better? And uh, there's no more uh, important time to do this than, than um, for this pandemic. Um, we must learn from uh, what we now know. Uh, and we can't forget that this happens. Human nature, is so resilient and positive that 
a lot of times I think we naturally try to move on from things. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that we um, need to focus on and we need to remember and spend money on uh, in order to make sure that when this arises again, because evolution will continue to work and will continue to prevent, to um, present the human species with, with challenges like this, um, that we are prepared. So two, um, you know, as a society, two things I think that we um, can and should do are um, creating and maintaining organizations that um, have uh, uh, are very adept and nimble at um, identifying threats, um, infectious threats, um, and tracing them and containing them. Uh, I think that's that's going to be hugely important. Um, and then the second is um, that we know that a lot of pandemics start uh, when we come very close to animals. Mm. And um, as is human nature, we have um, taken over a lot of spaces that belong to animals and um, we encroach on their territory more and more every single day. And um, education in this regard is so important um, to prevent unnecessary contact that um, uh, could lead to uh, another pandemic in the future. Right. I think, you know, personally, I, I, I think that we can look at Buckley as a great example um, mm -hmm. and be optimistic about the future. I know I do as a parent. Um, it is absolutely breathtaking to watch what has occurred here over the last six months. Um, and I think we can be inspired by that and use it as a model. So in March, we were all home. It took us by surprise. We didn't have our books. We, we had teachers using all of their creativity to deliver um, education. There were technical glitches that we couldn't avoid. And, um, you know, instead of burying our heads in the sand, yeah. you Thank and you. the staff and the teachers took a tremendous amount of extra time and decided that their goals were safety and education. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to do to accomplish those goals? Okay, we're gonna put barriers up, we're gonna build tents, we're gonna spend money on Chromebooks in case people feel more comfortable mm -hmm. being at home so that they can still have access to proper education so that we can flip a switch and go home if we need to. And by setting those clear goals and with the, the dedication and the, and the unbelievable hard work of, of you and your staff, you you guys are here or you're at home getting a great education and I hope that you remember that as well um, I hope that we all can have a sense of gratitude for that I know I do Thank you. Um, and you know whether that means just enjoying your Buckley education just a little bit more you know thanking your teachers just that one extra time, making them not have to repeat something through a mask because it's harder, um, helping your parents unload the dishwasher because <laughs> you know that they just came home from work and their work is more stressful because of all That's of this. Right. You know, every challenge is an opportunity and this one is no different. And even though there are sad lessons to learn, there are, um, wonderful ways that we can all be better after this and during this. That's great. Thank you so much. And I know Absolutely. that all the teachers and the staff and I certainly appreciate the, yeah. the compliments and the vote of confidence. So thank you. And actually your point, I think, relates to Orlando's question in terms of being prepared for the next pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, through education and, you know, doing what you have to do when you're in school to maybe become, you know, dedicated doctors like you or scientists mm -hmm. and people are going to help us figure out what to do yeah. uh, in case that should happen again. So thank you. Listen, I, I wanted to, to thank you um, for sharing your expertise and I know all the research you, you did also on this particular Absolutely. topic to uh, educate us and our students. Um, and I really look at you as a source of inspiration as well, Thanks. because I'm amazed by the fact that um, you're able to manage a very successful career and very busy practice, raise three sons, 
uh, and serve on the board of Buckley and I'm sure volunteer for other organizations. And at the same time, I know that you also have taken mission trips, right, to Ecuador. And mm -hmm. I just, I was wondering if we could end on that because I think it's such an inspiration for our students. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, as you know, I'm an ophthalmologist, I'm a glaucoma um, and cataract surgeon, and I had the great fortune last year of uh, traveling to Riobamba, Ecuador, um, which is a place where people simply do not have access to health care. Um, and um, to um, uh, provide surgical and uh, mostly surgical care, um, myself and another surgeon were able to perform 99 cataract and glaucoma wow. surgeries. And it's been heartbreaking to me that we could not return this year because sure. of coronavirus. Um, I, I guess what I would say is, I think that there's always an opportunity to um, do more and help people. And I think that the children in this school are, are well positioned to um, show their compassion and humanity to the world, both now and as, as Buckley graduates. And um, I think, I always remind my kids of this and it irritates them, but we are so lucky. Mm -hmm. We are so lucky here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need those moments to see how fortunate you are that if you are ill, if you are not feeling well, you have read, ready, easy, affordable access to healthcare. healthcare. And um, it's really, you know, it's devastating and unacceptable that so many people, so many other humans don't have don't that. Have that. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, my wish, we played a game in the household the other night is what, what if you have, what's your one wish for your career? My one wish is that I could bring my children with me once um, to see that because I really do believe it changes you and makes you realize just how yeah. unbelievably fortunate yeah. we are. Great. Thank you. And actually, I want to end on this very uh, inspirational message from Dr. Angela Lee. Thank you so much for Absolutely. helping us better understand this pandemic. Uh, wherever you are now, let's give uh, Dr. Angela Lee a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.